Uh, so uh, another principle, focus oversight on the controllers, not the controlled. I think most people would agree with that. Um, and, and it's one of the concerns of today is that we're, we're trying to uh, focus a lot of attention on, on um, folks who are not exactly uh, behind the steering wheel <laughs> in a lot of cases. We've, we've en- you, you say that everybody agrees on this, but we've engineered a society with exactly the opposite principle, right? I mean, it's like in, in pandemic workplaces where you're working from home or whatever, you, there's new technologies that actually some companies have put like sensors in the chairs to make sure that the person's actually sitting there. I mean, it's so dystopian. And, and yet it's not like Enron was brought down by, you know, the person taking a five minute extra long lunch break. It was it was the people who weren't being watched who were embezzling or, or cooking the books or whatever. And so, you know, my, my point is that with the responsibility of leadership comes extra scrutiny. And, and yet we have a lot of the surveillance mechanisms of modern society trained at the people who can do the least damage. And I think it's very bizarre that we've come up with that system. I mean, it makes sense because the people who are setting up the system don't want to be watched themselves. But, you know, the idea of like keystroke logging for employees, I mean, if you're going to roll that out for the employees, you better roll it, roll it out for the CEO too, I think. And that's wow. The, that CEO would veto that shit and be like, what, you're yeah, going to monitor my keystrokes? That's Screw right. Screw that, Brian. <laughs> Everyone's keystrokes now are anonymized. <laughs> I decree it. Um, I just want to go on the record and say if I were the incoming prime minister of the UK and I was given that choice, I would uh, write in the envelope that the submarine commanders should do what they think is best because I feel like they can process the situation. They can get new information. uh, They can see what the most appropriate action is. I mean, you've given someone control of a nuclear submarine. Like you, You have to kind of assume that they have a pretty good head on their shoulders. They're commanding, you'd assume, also dozens of people uh, under seas for a length of time. So anyway, just wanted to suggest that that would be my move. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, it just seemed like the best choice to me. Um, the, there, I'm going to tell a story now about your next principle, um, which is you say to utilize randomness to uh, increase security with uh, minimal invasion of privacy. And I'm just going to tell a quick story. I was a camp counselor at a camp for, uh, you know, maybe like 12 year olds, 13 year olds, something like that. I was 19 or 20. Um, And so the deal was that uh, I was on duty every other night, Um, but the campers didn't know which was which. Um, You know, like I, I was on duty for half an hour after lights out every night, but then every other night, I could do whatever the hell I wanted after that time. Um, and so me and whoever was off duty would go out and like go to TGI Fridays and get some drinks and the rest of it. Um, but I just remember what an effective deterrent it was because to the kids, it was like I was always there. Like, 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 like they, didn't, they didn't know I had every, every other night off. Um, so like that, like I, I love the idea of like, like, look, you just need to insert some randomness in there and just introduce the possibility that someone could be there, and then all of a sudden, be, people's behavior will improve. Yeah, so so the, the I, I love that story because it it jives really well with the one that I talk about in the book, which is the um, the conversation I had with the former head of internal affairs at NYPD, and he set up these drug stings where you know they've got they tell this guy to like go and babysit a crime scene where there's you know, a ton of cocaine on the table and $20,000 in cash, but nobody's been there. So they see what he does. They, you know, does he pocket six grand and then report that he seized $14,000? What's amazing about that story, though, is that they have 500 of these they do. They do 500 sting operations. Then they survey the cops and they say, how many of you were subject to a sting in the last year? And 12,000 cops say they were subject to a sting. And the reason for that is because if you put out 500, some of those people are actually going to encounter real situations where there's drugs on the table and money on the table, and they're going to think it's a sting. And it starts to create this sort of impression of like, maybe this is just a setup. And there's some sort of healthy dose of, of sense of you know, potential consequences. The, the really funny thing about that study, though, is they, they, had, um, they had like people, which is, it's an amazing job, you can imagine, the NYPD. They had people like go up to cops and try to like provoke them to punching them. So they would like, they would, like insult them. The sting. And of course, if the cop. The insulting yeah, the, pedestrian sting. 
It's it's right, and like, and if they if they punch the pedestrian, uh, they would you know face consequences or get fired or whatever, and and it's just like, but the value of this is that because it was random, the effect of it was much much higher than if if they'd actually said you know oh we're gonna do fifty sting operations this year because then the uncertainty doesn't exist now. I don't want to live in a dystopian society where like the the break room fridge is like baited, you know, to see who's going to take the, the the sandwich. But I think for people who are in immense positions of, you know, positions of immense authority or positions that are prone to abuse, that the occasional threat of random oversight is very very effective. I've got it. Members of Congress just get offered money at random and then in some cases it's like busted. And so then when members of Congress get offered stuff, they'd be like, oh, I can't take this. Huh? Am I fixing things? Well, I, you know, I don't actually think that's like the stupidest idea. I think that there's something, I think there's something to the, so in the UK right now, there's this sleaze scandal, they call it, where lo and behold, the people who got the contracts for a lot of the COVID services of testing and so on happened to be people that were friends with some of the ministers. You know, I don't actually think it would be that bad of a thing to occasionally plant, you know, fake contractors. Oh, I, I'm into it. We should. I, I I wasn't really kidding. We should totally just yeah. have like freaking fake, uh, <laughs> fake real estate deals and other garbage in there. You know, fake stock market tips, fake <laughs> pandemics. Be like, hey, oh you know, and then see if they buy Zoom stock, and then you're like busted. <laughs> Um, this pandemic wasn't real. The last three were. So, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I mean, the, these systems would be very, very helpful. I mean, a, a lot of them spoke to me as very consistent with human behavior. Uh, and a lot of them, you can actually try and marry a political reform to. Um, I'm going to close with your last uh, principle, which I thought was very, very powerful and correct, which is, Stop waiting for principled saviors, make them instead. And um, this is really the point of your book is that, look, you have people, you have incentives and systems, and uh, if you're waiting for Superman to come along, then you know it's probably not going to happen. And oh, by the way, Superman probably couldn't fix this shit anyway. Um, so what you need to do is you need to try and actually make the system attractive and uh, the kind of system that will attract and empower the right people. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the this is the ultimate answer to these problems that we've all identified. I mean, we're unhappy with our leadership class. We're unhappy with the people who are seeking and obtaining power. So why don't we do anything about it? You know, I mean, we can we can just Too wait hard. and hope and yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we, I mean, we can we can wait and hope that there's going to be some massive you know, wave of good leaders that just sort of stumble upon our lives and, and fix everything. That would be great if that happened. But I think we need to think very, very carefully about how you engineer systems to ensure that those people end up in power. And, you know, what I've been baffled by is like, why don't we have that conversation? Like we always have It's our media, brother. Our media doesn't give a shit about what you're talking about. Our media just wants to piss us off about the, the, the person's wrong action or wrong statement of the day. And then we can decide who to get mad at tomorrow, who to get mad at the next day. Um, you know, our, our media just whipsaws people and their sentiments. Um, and a corrupt system doesn't make good cable news. Well, I, th that's what I call like the tip of the iceberg problem, which is like you've got this whole phenomenon around power, the systems, the people who don't obtain it under the surface. The tip of the iceberg is the people who are in power. And it, it makes sense to focus on them. They're visible. They're, they, they matter. You might crash into them. But I think that that's all we focus on. You know, we don't think about the the system and the people who aren't making it into power, the introverts, the 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 different you know candidates who couldn't possibly win office because they don't have twelve million dollars in the bank. You know, this and, and and I think this is where smart reforms can make a better world. I think that's the the really important take, and it's where I you know see eye to eye with 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 a lot of what you're doing is. This is something where we can change it. We, we're, we're not like beholden to a world where we just think our leaders are corrupt and bad and self-interested and narcissistic. 
you get the you get the people that you have a system made for. You know, a rotten system attracts rotten people. A good system attracts good people, and our system is is rotten. So the the answer isn't to just sort of berate the people who end up there. It makes sense. We're going to do that anyway. It's to actually make the system good, so that we don't have to do that in the end. And I think that's the ultimate uh, answer to this this big problem of how power corrupts people and how corruptible people get power. I agree with you 100%. We need to focus on the mechanics of the system, the incentives it produces. Uh, It's why I'm doing the work that I'm doing, which is trying to diminish the power of the extremes, empower the reasonable, somewhat silent majority. Uh, Yeah, so it's one reason why I enjoyed your book so much. I am going to suggest something to you that, you know, it's something that troubles me and that this will be our closing note. Like right now, the the system is rotten. It attracts rotten people. It makes reasonable people less reasonable over time and more rotten. Um, and, and now there's this real dubiousness where if someone comes along, um, we just want to tear them down. And, and I will say that right now the media is very much animated by this energy. It's like what someone's trying to do something, like let's try and shiv that person in some way. Uh, and because you know, they have to be corrupt. And so we we're going to show how corrupt they are. And this, by the way, is one of the things that's dissuading a number of, in my view, pretty good people from doing something like running for office is because they know that to the extent they have any foibles or dirty laundry, it's going to get dragged out for all to see. You do have an environment where, you know, that there was a, a woman, Alexi Hammond, who tweeted something that people didn't like when she was a minor. I think she was like 17 and then she like loses her job over that. Um, And and so like in in that environment, uh, it's one of the concerns I have, frankly, is like, so you have this rotten system, you have this churn. And then if someone comes in now, there's this impulse. It's like, oh, like, let's let's tear this person down. What's wrong with them? What's wrong with them? Uh, And so you have this increasingly inchoate mess where uh, that your trust just gets uh, lower and lower um, so I, I suppose I'm doubling down in your case where this cha- this sort of change is very, very much overdue because it's contributing to the loss of trust. You know, this is something that I grappled with, uh, grappled with a lot when I was writing the book because, as I said before, I, I sat down with some really unpalatable, pe- unpalatable people. But people are really complicated. You know, I, I wish that we could have that conversation where it's just like there's no – uniformly virtuous person and no uniformly evil person for the most part in our society. Not a shades of gray. We're, yeah. And and I think this is something where you can have that grown up conversation. You can say, look, we're not looking for a saint. We're looking for someone who's going to make the world better. And that's something that I think is, is a, a really important recognition because otherwise you have a sort of random effect too, right? Like randomly somebody who has a a terrible view when they're 16 years old happens to tweet it. Somebody who's 16 years old doesn't tweet it, says it to their friend, and one of them gets destroyed and one doesn't. I mean, that's 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 randomness, right? And it's it's something where I think we don't want to engineer systems where we insist upon 100% mistake-free leadership. I think that also people who make mistakes learn from the, those mistakes. So to me, you know, I I grapple with this and how I wrote about people who I don't admire because some of the people in the book that I sat down with, I think did some really vile stuff, but I was trying to convey that they're, they're dealing with different pressures. They're talking to, uh, different systems. They're navigating, uh, you know, a culture of power that's different from ours. And maybe we would behave similarly if we were thrust into that position. But instead what we like to do is say, Oh, they're bad. We're good. You know? And I, I, I think there's something, much more complicated going on where it would be better for us as a society if we didn't want to have somebody who was 100% perfect, but instead was working hard to make a system better for the rest of us, because that's ultimately what the goal of politics and power should be. 